In the previous video, we talked a bit about what space debris is and the risk it poses to us Earthlings. Let's now look at what we can do about it. steps are being taken to solve it or at least reduce its impact. Well, first we want to make sure anything that goes up there is safe in case of any collisions. In the early days of spaceflight, impact studies were performed with the aim of understanding the impact of meteorites on spacecraft. The same concepts developed there uh, could be applied to space debris mechanics. From these studies, shielding approaches were developed to prevent impact with the spacecraft structure that could lead to system failure. Shielding simply means reinforcing the structure of the spacecraft so collisions do not affect its uh, mission and usually aim to prevent damage from collisions with very small objects that cannot be tracked. Initially, monolithic shields were used where single layers of material as part of the spacecraft outer walls are used to absorb the impact. However, this would translate to increased spacecraft weight, which is not ideal. Later on, the Whipple shield was introduced where a sacrificial bumper at the front of the spacecraft absorbs the initial impact and breaks down the impacting object with the real wall used to contain the smaller break-off debris created. Different implementations of the Whipple shield, such as the multi-shock and stuffed Whipple shields, have also been implemented, along with honeycomb panels, which are particularly stiff to do their special structure. In addition, multi-layered materials that include foams have been proposed for use on space habitats as well. Of course, satellite designers have to make all these structures light, which makes coming up with a solution more challenging. So what do you do to make sure you don't lose money due to accidents? You try insurance. From a financial and business perspective, satellites are insured so if a deadly collision happens, the satellite operator or manufacturer can build a replacement or at least does not lose their investment. Insurance has to cover both the likelihood of mission failure and the liability for potential collisions with other objects and is usually broken down based on the different phases of the mission. But of course, insurance also costs money, which can be um, 0.5% of the cost of a satellite per year, and considering the cost of satellites can be high, this could be a lot of money. Another solution is to make sure satellites have a longer lifetime so we do not need to send more objects up there in space. We also need to make sure they are maneuverable throughout their lives so they can avoid space debris impacts. While this can be done to an extent for very large satellites, there are still limitations in terms of the amount of fuel that can be put into a satellite. Moreover, technology progresses so fast that onboard electronics might become incompatible with technologies on Earth. For smaller satellites, limitations on size almost prevent you from having very long lifetimes. A solution for larger, usually more expensive satellites is to make them serviceable. Not every satellite is serviceable, and the only case where a spacecraft was actually serviced was the case of the Hubble Space Telescope. Hubble had several components designed as orbital replacement units components that could be replaced in space, while its optical problems also meant other repairs were needed. Of course, all these repairs were done by crewed missions, something that does not make sense for other satellites. Concepts for automated on-orbit servicing of spacecraft have been studied for a while now, with some satellite operation operators uh, showing interest in using serviceable spacecraft. The concept of refueling has already been demonstrated in 2013 in space, and the engineering test satellite uh, mission of JAXA even showed autonomous module swapping. The idea is really simple. Basically, an unmanned servicing satellite approaches a customer satellite, connects with it using pre-planned interfaces, makes adjustments such as updating hardware modules or refueling the spacecraft, and then leaves. This approach can not only be used to increase satellite life, but can also help bring to life satellites that might have been inserted to the wrong orbit or require tugging into a different location within their orbits. For satellites or rocket bodies that are completing their life, post-mission disposal becomes important. 
Basically, this means deciding what to do after the spacecraft has completed its mission. For satellites that are very high, for example, the geostationary satellites, we can park satellites into graveyard orbits, which is similar to what we do to planes on Earth. But with so many satellites being flown and so many of them lacking propulsion systems, this is not a plausible solution for many satellites. For lower Earth orbit systems, they should be actively or passively deorbited within an acceptable time frame. Passive deorbiting means allowing the spacecraft to enter the atmosphere itself, like what was done with the Chinese space station Tiangong-1. A passive reentry is sometimes inevitable, but if done by choice, uh, studies need to be made to make sure that it does not pose a threat to human life. When passive entry is not fast enough or safe, a controlled or active reentry is used where the spacecraft is boosted into an orbit on a collision course with Earth, enabling more control on where the debris falls and reducing the risk to human life. This was done in the case of the Russian Mir space station, for example, and is also used with uh, launch vehicle, upper stages, and other uh, space debris. Finally, we need to remove the existing debris that is not going to deorbit soon itself. Current guidelines require that post-mission orbital lifetime of objects should be limited to 25 years, which is what has been dubbed the 25-year rule. However, research has shown that without removing the existing debris, we will go towards a point of no return. With the increasing number of objects being launched, the 25-year rule seems too long for a sustainable orbital environment. In fact, NASA research suggests 5 to 10 objects uh, need to be removed per year in addition to post-mission disposal to stabilize the space debris environment. There are different methods being studied for removing space debris, but they can generally be broken down to active and passive methods. Passive debris removal is based on the idea of non-selective removal of objects. A removal of spacecraft, sometimes called a sweeper or janitor satellite, is inserted into an orbit with a high density of orbital debris, collides with them, and uses some sort of technology to stick debris to itself. Then it deorbits owing to its high surface area, taking the debris down with it. This method is suitable for removing small and medium-sized debris. For such applications, a sweeping surface or a low-density material, foam-like or aerogel, uh, have been proposed with a large air surface area for grabbing more debris and also increasing drag for deorbiting, while also being cheap enough to launch. Active debris removal is targeted removal of space debris, which is more suitable for larger pieces of debris such as rocket bodies or intact satellites. The main approach here is hunting the debris of interest, somehow connecting with it, and then slowing it down so it drops altitude. This will require a capability to grab non-cooperating or uncontrolled objects in space. Nets, baskets, harpoons, magnetic coupling, tentacles, and robotic arms have all been suggested as potential solutions for this problem. A means of propulsion is also needed to deorbit the debris uh, removal of spacecraft, and for this, other than traditional chemical propulsion systems, electrodynamic tethers and drag sails have been proposed. Another method of space debris removal is laser ablation uh, from the surface of the Earth. In this method, objects are heated up uh, by surface-based lasers, and uh, this is used as a way of reducing their speeds or adjusting their orbit and deorbiting them. However, this effect requires a lot of power and is limited by atmospheric disturbances. So, satellites are insured against damage, shielded to reduce the impact of collisions, and generally disposed of post-mission to reduce the number of space debris objects. And there seems to be solutions to reduce the number of space debris objects in orbit already. Yet, you've probably never heard of a space debris removal mission or an on-orbit servicing platform. What is preventing us from implementing these solutions? Well, for that, you'll have to wait for our next video. Thank you for watching, and see you next time.